The Premier League is back. That's right, a league where the bottom club now receives more in broadcast revenue every season than the Serie A title winners, relegation threatened clubs take players off Champions League teams for 50 million quid, and at the end of it all, Manchester City inevitably win it again, assuming their Emirati state ownership regime doesn't get found guilty of numerous financial breaches and they're sent down. Ah, the beautiful game. You're excited, I'm excited, this guy certainly looks excited. One group of people who we are told probably shouldn't be too excited though, time and time again this summer, are the fans of the three newly promoted clubs. It is one of the great ironies of English football that reaching the Premier League is simultaneously the pinnacle of all but a handful of clubs' modern histories, a moment of immense ecstasy and jubilation, and financially transformative, yet it is also a precursor to immediately being told, <clears throat> yeah, you know that whole winning thing you've just got used to and have been enjoying? Yeah? Uh, well, Try to forget about all of that. You won't be doing much of that anymore, boys. It's a backs to the walls job, I'm afraid. A gruelling 38 game slog where you'll be thrashed at least five times, lose the will to live a further six, and uh, oh, uh, did I mention VAR? Yeah, you know how last season when you scored, you could jump up and celebrate and it was all thrilling and magical, like it's meant to be when you score a goal. Yeah, uh, well, well Try to forget about that as well. Now you just sit and wait to see if some blokes in a business estate in Hillingdon will grant you a goal or tell the ref to take a look at the monitor and, inevitably therefore, a massive dump on all of your hopes and dreams. Still, I'm sure you'll score at least another 10 or 15 goals this season that will count. Um, I'm going to go back to being me now. Leicester, City, Ipswich Town and Southampton were the three lucky teams or not so lucky ones when you put it like that, to win promotion from the championship last season. And they have been rewarded by the bookies by being immediately installed as the three favorites to go straight back down. There are lots of people currently pointing to Bournemouth splashing out potentially in excess of 40 million pounds on a single signing, and Brighton racking up a transfer bill approaching 200 million pounds following their spending spree this summer, and asking the question, what hope have the three newbies really got? Fresh in everyone's minds is also the three promoted teams from last season, who were all pitiful, and went straight back down. I said all three of them would go down last summer, which, unlike this summer, wasn't a particularly fashionable view at the time. Few fancied Luton or Sheffield United, but Burnley's massive points tally in the championship, their more than £90 million summer spend, and the high regard that Vincent Company was held in, all conspired to create an environment in which most people were backing them to retain their Premier League status. Some people, would you believe it, even backed them to finish in the top 10. Luton, who were the least fancied of the three promoted teams, I made an entire video about saying that I liked their modest recruitment and that, whilst they would most likely still go down, I thought they'd been financially responsible, should be well prepared for life back in the championship, and would probably put up more of a fight than either of the other two promoted teams. Meanwhile, it would be fair to say that I was never particularly enthusiastic about Sheffield United's prospects. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is that I am a remarkably prescient genius, bordering upon godlike in fact, with supernatural powers of insight when it comes to the three promoted clubs each season. I am clueless about literally everything else, general knowledge, all football outside of the newly promoted teams, love making, but this one very specific niche, self-evidently, is where I come into my own. So, I know that the whole world of football has been waiting with bated breath, wondering, what does the Oracle of East Yorkshire make of the three promoted teams this season? Well, world of football, wait and wonder no longer. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey from Portman Road to St. Mary's as we take a look at this season's promoted teams, how they have prepared for life in the Premier League, and ultimately, their prospects this season in the top flight. Leicester City were like a Premier League team in the Championship last season, as they looked to run away with the league title before suffering a slight wobble. On Valentine's Day, Leicester fans were loving life back in the Championship, as they enjoyed a massive 12-point lead at the top of the table, with Leeds in second, with only 14 games remaining. Leicester only won 6 of their last 14 matches though, with over 60% of their defeats coming in the final 30% of the campaign. 
That could perhaps be attributed to complacency, since Leicester had found life in the championship almost too comfortable up to that point. Although, that in of itself would be somewhat of a concern, in terms of what it said about a potential mental fragility, for all of their talent, within the Leicester squad. Nonetheless, Leicester still amassed an enormous 97 points, the 11th highest total in the history of the championship, and they still managed to win the title, emerging as the strongest of arguably the most formidable four teams that the championship has ever seen in a single season. That probably shouldn't be all that surprising. Leicester kept the core of their Premier League squad together following their relegation, and that was a surprise relegation to begin with. Harvey Barnes and James Madison departed for big fees, and Yori Tillemans' contract expired, but the Foxes kept hold of the likes of James Justin, Ricardo Pereira, Vout Fass, Yannick Vestergaard, Wilfred and Didi, Kalecci and Acho, Pats and Dakar and Jamie Vardy, as well as strengthening that, frankly, Premier League quality core, with the likes of Harry Winks, Connor Cody and Steffi Mavadidi, plus four formidable loan signings by championship standards, in Callum Doyle, Cesare Cassade, you Jonas Atgen, and Abdul Fatawu. So, in some ways, Leicester are a newly promoted club in name only. Of course, they are a newly promoted club, because they just won promotion, but their squad, even with no new faces, isn't comparable to either Burnley, Sheffield United, or Luton's last season. It is packed full of Premier League, and indeed, international experience. With that being said, Leicester haven't been able to enjoy a post-promotion pre-season free of turbulence. Chelsea, in their eternal wisdom, poached Leicester's head coach Enzo Maresca, who was previously Pep Guardiola's assistant for a season at Man City, uh, both of them bald, as you can see there, and not content with just that, they also stole Leicester's star man last season in the championship, Kiernan Dewsbury Hall. Well, uh, they didn't actually steal him, just to be clear. They paid them £30 million, but you get the idea. Leicester have also lost a fair amount of experience in Mark Albrighton, Kalecci and Acho and Dennis Pratt, all of whom were out of contract this summer and have departed on free transfers. Club legend Jamie Vardy, by contrast, now age 37, has signed a fresh new one-year deal on reduced terms. Dewsbury Hall will be a big miss for Leicester. He was talismanic in the championship last season, scoring 12 goals and making 14 assists, producing the kind of form that he might have been capable of in the Premier League, had it not have been for injuries, but also taking on significant leadership responsibilities as a homegrown academy graduate who joined Leicester at the age of seven. Leicester were forced to sell Dewsbury Hall early on in the window for less than they would have liked due to the pressure placed on them in regard to profit and sustainability regulations. Despite raising significant revenue through the sales of Ben Chilwell, Wesley Fofana, and Harry Maguire before that, Leicester have absolutely hemorrhaged cash in recent years, largely due to an enormous wage bill. In the 2022-23 season, in which Leicester were relegated from the Premier League, they had the highest wage bill outside of the Big Six. At £206 million, Leicester's wage bill was the highest that it had ever been, up more than 70% since the 2017-18 season, in which they finished 9th. It was only £29 million less than Arsenal's, who finished as Premier League runners-up that season, and £19 million more than Newcastle's, who qualified for the Champions League. On the continent, Leicester's wage bill was actually larger than Inter Milan's, who reached that season's Champions League final. I don't think some people realise quite how insane Premier League finances are, but even by those standards, Leicester were abnormal. They were the only Premier League team to spend in excess of 100% of their revenue on wages, and the end result, for the second year running, was a pre-tax loss of about £90 million, which would have been more than £150 million had it not have been for player sales. As a result, Leicester breached the Premier League's profit and sustainability regulations, exceeding the league's three-year rolling loss limit of £105 million, even after deducting allowable expenses, by somewhere in the region of £30 million. Leicester will receive a points deduction this season, therefore, almost certainly, it is just a question of how many points they will be docked. The likelihood is that it will be six points, which would obviously put a pretty significant dent in Leicester's survival aspirations. That is further complicated by the fact that the hearing itself isn't scheduled until early 2025, meaning that we will already be in the second half of the season when Leicester's fate is determined. 
That's why they had to sell Kane and Dewsbury Hall. It's why their net spend this summer is barely a million pounds, why they have shifted on several big earners, and, presumably, also why they are the bookies' favourites to go straight back down. With all of that having been said, I am perhaps not quite as doom and gloom about Leicester's prospects this season as many other people. For a start, I actually think that the loss of Enzo Maresca and the enforced appointment of Steve Cooper bolsters rather than hinders Leicester's survival hopes. That's not because Maresca is a bad coach, it's just that he is clearly very ambitious, and like Vincent Company last season, I think he most likely would have used this season at Leicester as an audition for a bigger job, more concerned with providing a proof of concept for his methods and style of play than with survival. Cooper, by contrast, who also has first-team managerial experience in the Premier League, unlike Maresca, is likely to be much more pragmatic. I think Cooper is a very good manager, and, despite the departures and lack of significant investments in new arrivals, he has some very talented players at his disposal. Leicester have excellent fullbacks, if they can stay fit, a very experienced double pivot at Premier League level in Harry Winks and Wilfred and Didi, and a couple of really exciting wingers. Facundo Buonanotte, signed on loan from Brighton, I think is a really exciting addition, and whether he can fill the void vacated by Dewsbury Hall this season may well prove pivotal, but the Leicester player that I'm most interested in seeing is Abdul Fatawu. Aged only 20, but already capped 21 times by Ghana, Leicester signed Fatawu for a reported £17 million from Sporting Club de Portugal this summer, having had him on loan in the Championship last season. Obviously a little raw, Fatawu has boundless potential, as was illustrated, by his eight Man of the Match awards last season at such a tender age. I think he is someone who is capable not only of stepping up to the Premier League, but actually flourishing with that step up in class. And without anyone who you would hang your hat on hitting double figures at the King Power Stadium this season, the likes of Fatawu, Buonanotte, and summer rival Bobby De Cordova Reed, on a free transfer from Fulham, all chipping in over the course of the season, will likely be crucial. Leicester won the championship title last season, but from what looked to be an unassailable lead in early 2024, they only ended up finishing one point above Ipswich Town. Ipswich's rise, which I covered in a feature-length video following their promotion, which, naturally, I would highly recommend after watching this, since it goes into much more detail about their project than I can here, really cannot be overstated. The three relegated teams were so strong in the championship last season, finishing between 12 and 22 points above every club other than Ipswich, but the Tractor Boys didn't just keep pace with them, despite only just having come up from League One. They were one point off winning the title, six ahead of Leeds, and nine above Southampton, making it back-to-back -back promotions from League One to the Premier League. Ipswich play brilliant football, in my opinion, incredibly organised and disciplined both in and out of possession, capable of playing it out from the back but only ever with a purpose, and always capable of switching the tempo up in an instant, mixing things up, and breaking with real speed, directness and ruthlessness. No one scored more goals in the championship last season than Ipswich, despite the fact that their own joint top scorers only managed to score 13 goals. Six Ipswich players chipped in with six goals or more though, and while centre forward is an area where they have looked to strengthen, as we will come on to, the fact that they are not dependent on any one or two individuals when it comes to goal scoring, I actually think is a major positive. Because Ipswich were the least fancy to the top four in the championship, every time that they wobbled last season, which happened a few times, people started to write them off. There was a run of one win in three in November, no wins in four in April, and, most notably, a run of one win in nine over the festive season, but every time, Ipswich showed fantastic spirit and resilience, bouncing back with a string of victories to silence their critics and bolster their own promotion hopes. Crucially, Kieran McKenna has kept the core of his squad together, not only maintaining that spirit, togetherness, and mental toughness, but clearly recruiting with it in mind. I never like it when, as we saw with Burnley last season, teams win promotion from the championship, meaning that they have obviously got a lot of things right, and then they rip up the team that got them there and start all over again, turning them into total unknowns. It worked for Nottingham Forest, just, who, in fairness, didn't have much choice in the matter, with half of their promotion winning team either out of contract or on loan, but nine times out of ten, it is a disaster. 
Ipswich have spent the most out of the three promoted clubs, just over £70 million net following the arrival of Sammy Smodix from Blackburn Rovers, but then that makes sense. Whereas Leicester City still had the bones of a Premier League squad, and one that finished fifth in the top flight and won the FA Cup as recently as 2021, Ipswich's four-year stay in League One only came to an end the season before last. Kieran McKenna's side are only the fifth team in the over 30-year history of the Premier League era to have won back-to-back -back promotions to English football's top flight, and the first since Southampton under Nigel Atkins back in 2012 so it is inevitable that reinforcements and some extra quality is required. Among Ipswich's eight summer recruits, three are players that I know extremely well from their time at Hull City. Jacob Greaves is a Hull City Academy graduate with over 200 EFL appearances to his name already at the age of only 23. A big, strong, left-footed and left-sided centre-back who is really comfortable on the ball and playing out from the back for £15 million with £3 million in add-ons, Greaves is an absolute bargain. Personally, I would be surprised if he didn't go on to play for England, maybe not as a regular, depending on competition there in a few years' time, but certainly in and around the squad. My only criticism of Greaves, having watched him live almost a hundred times, is that he can be reckless when it comes to things like grappling in the box from corners or free kicks, taking a big and often frankly unnecessary risk. Most of the time, in the championship, you'll get away with that sort of thing. But with VAR in the Premier League and the new guidance for officials this season to be stricter with any holding or pushing in the box, that is probably something that Greaves will have to work on and try to cut out of his game. Liam Delap, meanwhile, spent last season on loan at Hull City, and had he not been sidelined with a knee injury for the second half of the season, we would have made the playoffs. Delap's goal-scoring record might look uninspiring, and cause some people to question his £20 million price tag, but honestly, I think that might soon look like brilliant business. Delap is lightning quick, powerful, he can hold the ball up, he's great at rolling defenders and instigating attacks, with individual mazy runs, and he's still only 21 years old. There's a reason why Delap is the first choice number 9 for England under-21s, and why, again, he should be disappointed if he doesn't become a full England international. I think the goals will inevitably come for Delap, and if he can get 7 or 8 this season in a newly promoted team, at 21, that would be a good return. But Ipswich have also just signed someone with almost the precise opposite profile to him. Sammy Smodix isn't that young, he's about to turn 29, he isn't big, strong, or even particularly quick, and he isn't going to pin centre-backs, turn them, or go on mazy individual runs. He did, however, score 27 goals in the championship last season, and 33 in all competitions. It was a freak season, given that Smodix's previous best season in the championship at four attempts only saw him score seven goals, and it is that fact, combined with his age, which is why the championship's top scorer last season will only set Ipswich back £9 million. I think Smodix is much more of an unknown quantity in terms of how he will handle the step up to the Premier League than the likes of Greaves and Delap but it would be fair to say that he hit the ground running again at Blackburn this season, having already scored three goals in two games. Smodix is playing with so much confidence right now that he looks like every time he shoots, he believes he will score. For a striker, sometimes that is half the battle, and over the last 12 months, he has invariably been proven right in that belief. Playing off a big man like Delap or George Hurst, as he did with Sam Gallagher and Semir Talalovic at Blackburn last season, should suit Smodix down to the ground. But I just get the sense that getting off to a good start and continuing his rich vein of goal-scoring form will be vital to giving Smodix the belief that he is a Premier League player and could therefore determine his season as a whole. The most important business that Ipswich did this summer wasn't any of their new signings though, but rather, it was the new contract they handed Kieran McKenna, despite reported interest from Chelsea, Man United and Brighton. The ace up Ipswich's sleeve, McKenna, who previously worked as an assistant at Manchester United, has the potential to be an elite coach, if indeed he isn't already. His impact at Ipswich has been utterly transformative, tactically Ipswich are so disciplined yet fun to watch, and he has an outstanding record in terms of developing and getting the best out of players. 
Sam Borsi, who was playing in League One a couple of years ago, will make his Premier League debut this season, soon to turn 33, and shouldn't look out of place there. Amari Hutchinson, signed from Chelsea, had basically never played men's football before McKenna got his hands on him last season, yet now he is one of the most exciting players in this team, and Leif Davis, Ipswich's young left-back come wing-back, signed from Leeds, made an incredible 21 assists in 43 games in the Championship last season. Like Greaves, if Davis has a strong season, he could very shortly find himself in the England squad, even more so in his case perhaps, given England's lack of options at left-back and Luke Shaw's persistent injury problems. To be totally honest, if Ipswich had lost McKenna this summer, I would rate their survival hopes at somewhere close to zero. Not because they have terrible players and McKenna is their only hope, they have some very good players, as we've just discussed, but because it would have come as such a crushing blow to their players, supporters and club as a whole, that I feel like it would have completely taken the wind out of their sails ahead of their first season back in the Premier League in over 20 years. To my mind, and as with last season, I'm aware this isn't a popular opinion, Ipswich are the best prepared of the three promoted teams for life in the Premier League, despite the fact that the others were only relegated in 2023, and Ipswich last played in the Premier League in 2002. I think they've got a talented young squad with loads of potential, a fantastic team spirit, and an outstanding manager. All of which bodes well. That's not to say that it will be easy, of course. Ipswich have a brutal opening two games against Liverpool and Man City, which I think is regrettable since it will make putting points on the board and building confidence early on extremely difficult. They also have practically zero Premier League experience throughout their entire squad, in direct contrast to the other promoted teams, which makes them a great unknown. Southampton, for example, like Leicester, only lost four key first-team players following relegation, Mohamed Salisu, Tino Livramento, James Ward-Prowse and Romeo Lavia, managing to keep hold of the likes of Stuart Armstrong and Carl Walker-Peters, and strengthening most notably with the loan signings of Flynn Downs and Taylor Harwood-Bellis from West Ham and Man City. Downs and Harwood Bellis have been Southampton's two biggest arrivals this summer, both now signed on permanent deals, but the player that I'm most excited about might be Ronnie Edwards. Southampton signed Edwards for just £3 million, owing to the fact that he was playing in League One last season and only had one year left on his deal with Peterborough United. But don't let that fool you. A regular for England's under-20s over the last couple of years, Edwards is a really well-rounded, gifted and two-footed centre-back who has been honed in the tough environment of League One, meaning he should be up to any physical challenges, whilst also being elegant and capable on the ball, refined within the England youth ranks. Maybe there are some concerns that Harwood Bellis and Edwards are both so young and lacking in Premier League experience, but they are both quality players with really bright futures, and they will hopefully be guided by the more experienced Jan Bednarak and Jack Stevens. Japanese international Yukonari Sugavara seems like a smart addition at right back, or perhaps right wing back, and Carl Walker Peters on the opposite side has always been a Premier League quality fullback, hence why West Ham tried to sign him this summer. Ben Brereton Diaz, signed for just £7 million from Villarreal, scored six goals in 14 games on loan at a dreadful Sheffield United team during the second half of last season, and he is still only 25 years old. Southampton will be hoping that he and Adam Armstrong can form a formidable little and large partnership up front, a throwback of sorts, and score enough goals to keep them in the top flight. And ultimately, whether Armstrong can make that step up in class, which he has struggled to do in the past, may well determine the outcome of Southampton's season. As I was recording this, Southampton also announced the signing of Cameron Archer, who, um, despite struggling last season, again, in a truly dreadful Sheffield United I really can't emphasise enough how truly dreadful they were, uh, I think is a really talented player. So, um, if Armstrong doesn't come good... Uh, Southampton at least have a plan B. Anyway, I like Southampton's summer business. I haven't even mentioned Nathan Wood or the return of Adam Lalana, but I'll be honest, overall, I fear for them. Southampton shipped 63 goals in the championship last season, which is only two fewer than Birmingham City, who were relegated to League One. When teams pressed them, with purpose at least, they made mistakes, were easy to get at, and tended to concede goals. 
That's a big problem in the Premier League, where every weakness is hyper-exposed, and teams are absolutely ruthless when it comes to taking their chances. Manager Russell Martin is an interesting character, who plays an extremely possession-based style of football, which I think could run into one or two problems in the Premier League. In the interest of fairness, it should be noted that Martin adapted Southampton's style three times against a really good Leeds United team last season and emerged victorious on all three occasions. So he is capable of being more inventive and pragmatic, and I think that he'll have to do that much more often if Southampton are to stand any chance of staying up. I just fear that the Saints will ship too many goals, be too easy to play against, and will struggle to grind out the necessary points to steer clear of the drop. I think their midfield is a bit lightweight, they don't have an outstanding goalkeeper, and they are relying on one or two of Armstrong, Diaz, Stewart, and now Cameron Archer, striking gold in the Premier League, all of which are pretty significant unknowns. The current Premier League relegation odds, as I mentioned in the introduction, have the three promoted teams as the three favourites to go straight back down, with Leicester the favourites, followed by Ipswich, and then Southampton. As you've probably guessed, I don't agree with that ordering. Leicester's odds, presumably, are heavily influenced by a likely points deduction, but they are nonetheless the best prepared for life in the top flight in terms of experience and proven Premier League quality within their current ranks. Ipswich are unpredictable because they have almost no real Premier League pedigree, but I'm bullish about them because of McKenna and their summer business, and if they go down, they will have some very saleable assets and a squad that is tailor-made to run riot in the championship. Southampton have also recruited reasonably well, but I'm much less convinced of Russell Martin's ability to find ways of winning games in the Premier League than Kieran McKenna's, and defensively they will have to be so much better than last season just to give themselves a fighting chance. The big problem for all three promoted teams is that there aren't any other teams who have had car crash summers and look to be in real crisis heading into this season. Nottingham Forest and Wolves perhaps look to be the most precarious other than them, and you could add Brentford if they lose Ivan Tony. Fulham and Bournemouth could get dragged in, but it feels like the quality of their managers should be enough to steer them clear, and Everton, with Sean Dyche, feel like they will just grind out enough points, with only another hefty points deduction likely to put them in any danger. Amusingly, the next favourites to go down this season, after the teams that I just mentioned, are actually Manchester City, at odds of 10 to 1, albeit, for rather different reasons to the rest. I think one of the newly promoted teams will survive, and I think it's most likely to be Ipswich. Leicester, I think, have a similar quality of squad to the likes of Forest and Wolves, and I suspect they may well secure enough points to stay up without a deduction. It's just whether they can weather a potential six-point hit in a season of probably very fine margins. Southampton, who it feels like I'm really laying the boot into at this point, not quite as much as Sheffield United, but a little bit, could well click and prove me completely wrong, and I think they're stronger, on paper, than all three of last season's promoted clubs, and would probably have survived, therefore, in last season's Premier League. But this season, with few, if any, obvious candidates to go down, I think that it will be really tough. One thing I would say for Southampton, just to inject some positivity, is that after Newcastle away today for their opening game of the season, they do have a nice run of fixtures coming up against Forest, Brentford, Man United, Ipswich and Bournemouth in their next five games. That's probably make or break just about, even at this early stage, and I'm just not convinced that they'll take probably the minimum six or seven points that they need to take from those fixtures to give themselves a platform to build on for the rest of the season. But hey, what do I know? They say lightning doesn't strike twice, so my prophecies about the three promoted teams this season will probably age about as well as an episode of Little Britain. Thank you all for watching today's video regardless. Hopefully it was interesting, even if you disagree with my ultimate assessment, and the season ends up proving me entirely wrong. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. Be interesting to hear them. Uh, and of course, make sure that you're subscribed and have notifications turned on not just for this channel, HITC7s, but also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, where there are now three outstanding videos for you to all uh, feast your eyes and ears upon, so 
go ahead and do that. Both of those should be uh, on your screens now, along with a couple of videos. One from this channel and one from that channel, um, should you wish to watch them after this. Uh, and you can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or Threads via the username at HITC7s on all three, should you wish to do so. All of those links, plus a whole lot more, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.